All right, one more time. Uh, hello, everybody. I'm Michael Pierce. Obviously, I am in the same shirt and in the same room as the last video because I've recorded this right after said video, which is presumably the one that I've uploaded before this video. You get the idea. I made a pretty picture, and I want to explain it to you. That, that's why we're here. Uh, that's what we're here to talk about. Um, I am not... So this might freak some people out, mainly because I have done some a real number here. I'm not married to this. Um, I, I just wanted to explore it because I think there's some interesting symbolism and ideas that I want to see what people think of it. Because um, I, I was thinking of it as in tandem with all of the stuff that I talked about in the previous video. Um, and also from some of my discussions with Joe from Ghost of Young, so I'm sure he will be very excited. Uh, with, with uh, particularly with this part, but um, we'll get to that. Again, I'm not overhauling what I talked about in Modes and Beams. The concepts are still the same. I'm just changing some of the, the names and things to see how it feels. So, trying to think of the best place to start with this. Um, we'll, just, we'll just go around the circle. So what I've done here is, the main thing I was trying to do was connect them up with the elements and also with the tarot suits. So if you know anything about the symbolism of the tarot, it goes back to the medieval era, um, uh, particularly the Renaissance. And I have found it very fascinating. Um, there's, I don't talk about it explicitly in Motes and Beams, but it exercised a certain amount of influence, which I'm kind of doubling down on here um, and even changing things in order to fit it in just to see what happens. Uh, so the aristocrats, correspond with the suit in the tarot of swords, which represents the class of the nobility. So if you think in terms of like um, medieval archetypes, that, that's where you wanna, your headspace needs to be for this. So the notion of the nobility, because they're the ones who have the swords, they're the ones who go to war, they protect, um, but they, they're also kind of on top, and there's the notion they are exclusive, they are separated from everybody else. And there can be um, uh, very much this, it, the whole idea of it is this elitism. Um, the theocrats are the clergy, represented by the cups, because of the association of, of um, well, I mean, more generally, it's like water of life coming down from the church to feed the spirits of the people. Um, but also the association with like the sacrament or uh, the Eucharist communion in the church. Um, so there also is this exclusivity there with the clergy, but they are much more in direct contact with um, the common people than the um, nobility would be in the tarot symbolism. Uh, the merchants down here, so you'll notice there's cups, swords, and now we have coins. That's what those are. Those are coins, in case that weren't, wasn't clear. Uh, the technical term is pentacles because the coins would have the... Um, uh, uh, a pentagram, not because of Satan, it's an old symbol. It's been around for a long time. Um, it has many different meanings, but here we're just gonna stick with coins. Um, so, yeah, it, it's pretty straightforward. They're merchants and therefore they have the coins. So it's associated um, with the merchant class, uh, almost like the, uh, the rising bourgeoisie, uh, and some changing times there. So there's kind of a tension between them and the nobility because uh, the feudal nobility was one system and then the bourgeois coming in with their new monetary system and, and everything being reduced to cash value. We'll get into that in a moment, but you get the idea of the symbolism. The merchants are there, symbolized by coins. And finally, we have the what I refer to as the commons. Um, you could also say the peasantry. Um, they are represented, interestingly enough, by staffs. Uh, staffs like budding rods of wood, uh, you know, like a tree coming up. It's, it's an interesting image. It, you could also associate it with like wheat and agriculture, um, so that the agricultural connection is, is how it relates in with uh, the common folk. Um, it, there's also the notion of it coming directly out of the ground. So the elements that are associated with these the aristocrats are associated with air. They are rarefied, for one thing. There's this notion of them being refined. Uh, so they are, it, it's been purified until it has become like air. There's this notion of grace, um, but there's also this notion of apartness. They are elevated because air rises. 
Um, and uh, those are the main associations. You could also uh, compare it to like wind, like a mighty rushing wind coming in and destroying everything. Um, but mainly the notions of being high up, being rarefied, um, being separated. Uh, because the interesting thing, in my discussions with an ESFP friend of mine, it, it, um, not from me observing her, but from her reporting to me because she has a lot of um, interactions with people from the gamma quadra, the aristocratic temperament as I call it here, um, INTJs, ENTJs, ISFPs. And uh, it's been very interesting. Her One of the big things that she's noticed is this real sense of um, exclusivity that you can get, where the NTJ, uh, for example, will be like, okay, you've got me, and then you have a couple of other people who I'm like, you are cool. It's more, it usually has to do with like intelligence or there's something that I value and I want you on my team of highly trained people to save the world, you know. Um, you're part of the group and once you're in that group, there's this deep, there can be this very deep connection where it's like what's mine is yours almost um, and you almost like, it can almost go way too far where you flow into the other person, you are like linked up with them emotionally and they're, they're, as a result of that there's this notion of it's us and then there's the world and they're all the commoners but you are a noble, I can recognize it in your eyes because I like you and so you are, you're with me and we're going to be up here on top of our mountain looking down and laughing at the stupidity of the common folk while we do all our cool things. You see this all the time in Nietzsche, by the way. Um, this is kind of what Nietzsche wanted and that's why he's just such an archetypal version of this. He wanted to get his little group of friends and they were going to be the supermen and they were going to um, not like rule over anybody, at least not directly, um, but through their ideas uh, because they were just so much higher. So you kind of, you get that idea and you do get it with the ISFPs. The one, the odd man out is the ESFP. They seem to break the mold, but they're in some sense, though, they, they are very much fitting the aristocratic temperament in a different way, in the sense that there is this energy to them where they will, I don't know, it's just very easy for me to imagine the ESFP sort of hero going forth with a sword and um, like a force of nature, like a wind blowing through the area and not really thinking like you know these types would about I don't want to say consequences, but, but that's the quickest way of putting it. Um, so you get that idea there. Those are some of the concepts I wanted to get at there. Um, I'd also like to point out, so you'll notice I wrote contextual and universal here, because in my original system, these are the purely contextual types, these are the purely universal types, and then these were mixtures, but um, in lieu of some of the work I've been doing with Jack, and then also with Nick, um, my uh, uh, Brazilian friend, not my Portuguese friend. He speaks Portuguese because he translated most of memes into Portuguese, but he is from Brazil. Uh, just wanted to get that out there. Um, what was I talking about? Oh yes, uh, the notion of synthetic in analytic, which, are, which is sort of my adoption from some ideas Nick had given me. Um, but uh, the theocrat therefore becomes the purely synthetic type. Um, and the Democrat becomes the purely analytic type. Now the important thing here is that it's purely contextual, but because of, because SENI, this is the interesting thing, SENI is by definition both contextual and synthetic. It is the function axis that is contextual and synthetic at the same time. And that same goes for all of, all four of the function axes. They are this mixture of the two. So. Aristocrats are a mixture of two function axes, but a function axis is a mixture of two temperaments. So there's kind of this reciprocity there that I like. But anyway, the point being that they are wholly contextual, but then they share in both synthetic and analytic, the aristocrats, right? And then what they don't have is the universal. And this is fun because it kind of mimics the, um, the function stack, where you have the dominant, and then you have the auxiliary and tertiary, and then you have the inferior, which is directly opposite to it. So that's, that's an interesting thing that I found. Um, uh, ba, 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 ba. So we've covered the aristocrats. 
Um, and I suppose at this point it's worth uh, talking, diverging again, just to talk about the, uh, the axes a little more. Because I assigned them, because I linked these up with the four elements in a different way than I did in Motes and Beams, it enabled me to link up the Aristotelian um, basic elements. And Aristotle's system of four elements, which you can watch my video about that or look it up on Wikipedia, but mine is more in-depth and I imply the connection with the system. Anyway, um, Aristotle constructs the four traditional elements out of four properties or contrarieties is the term that we usually translate it as. Um, and those are wet, dry, hot, and cold. So water is cold and wet, air is hot and wet, which may not make sense to us, but that's because it's more of like the concept of vapor. And it does make sense if you think of like clouds, right, up in the air. They had the notion of the clouds are wet, so it's hot and wet. Fire is dry and hot, and earth is cold and dry. Cool. Uh, so S-E-N-I is wet. Which, um, so actually the way I determined how these were connected was mainly through the judgment axes because it just, I've decided it makes a lot of sense to me archetypally or symbolically if TEFI is hot and FETI is cold. Um, in my observations, FETI there, and I've t I remember talking about this before when I, in my old videos, old videos where I compared FETI to like a robot that has a very nice human skin on it, and it's trying to be human, but at bottom it is a robot, and it is operating according to these robotic uh, notions. And so it, it can appear very warm, but there's this very calculating side to it internally. So it's hot on the outside and cold on the inside, whereas TEFI is often cold on the outside, but it's warm on the inside. It's like a person inside of like a mech suit, right? So you got this, squishy feeling emotional human being inside of this cold mechanical exterior suit. So it's this flipping of the two. And so this is following up on that because of the, and it, you know, in some sense it, it privileges the, uh, the introverted aspect of it. But I also feel like people have noticed that TEFI types, even like the ENTJ, there's this sense of like, they're more like fire. They're more like interior warmth. Um, you know, providing this exterior molten outside, whereas here there's, there's this calculation to it um, that even I'm perfectly happy to admit that comes up in the way in which they interact socially with people, um, often calculating, okay, how precisely, what is the precise amount of emotional pressure to place on this person, whereas with TEFI, um, they don't seem to really think in quite that way. Um, it, you get the idea. I don't want to go off too much on a tangent. So that, that was how I assigned those two. And then wet and dry, it just made sense to me that S-E-N-I is more wet um, because there's this notion of like it, everything just getting very moist and sort of merging together a bit. And it makes sense because it's related more to synthetic. It's contextual and synthetic. Um, whereas dry works much nicer with analytic um, because it, it things suck it sucks the moisture the the moisture out of things and I do relate it more with extroversion um, overall in moats and beams but it sucks the subjective moisture out and things dry and kind of can be analyzed into separate parts is maybe a way of looking at it um, I, I I would like to sit down and really explore more the symbolic meaning going on here and see if I can come up with better, more clear um, uh, uh, ways of describing the connection. But anyway, to, to get through the rest of this, as I said, theocrats are the clergy. They're related to water, um, which are held in cups. Uh, so you have the notion, you got a lot of notions here because one of the things about, so there's two things about the theocratic types. I've brought out in recent videos the notion of um, the theocratic types having this relationship with the persona. There's the notion of they're always naturally kind of putting on a persona that they embody almost to the point that they become that. You get a lot of actors, I think, from the theocratic temperament, STPs and NFJs. Um, 
you know, even the ISTPs, you, you know, you get Tom Cruise, Clint Eastwood, you get a bunch of ISTP actors, and they're actors not necessarily, I mean, some of them have tremendous range, but often it's not so much that they have lots of range, it's that they embody perfectly this particular persona or archetype. Clint Eastwood is a perfect example of this. It, it, he just, he fully embraces this like, he's Clint Eastwood and it's like, oh, you you go to a Clint Eastwood movie to see Clint Eastwood, not to see who Clint Eastwood is playing. <laughs> and I mean, that goes for a lot of actors, but um, it's very different over here where you have, say, an ENFP who in some sense I think is horrified by the notion that they would be trapped in just one persona, in just one way that they uh, are seen by the world. They want to have much more freedom to choose between personas, but the ISTP is like, no, I want the one. I want the one that works. Um, but anyway, that's sort of a side note. The important thing is this notion of acting and this idea of, um, you have like the notion of the pageantry of the medieval church, right? The notion of facade is too charged. I mean, you certainly can have that for sure. That's like the, the dark side of it, where it's just a facade and everybody is playing up um, these personas and sort of socially jockeying with each other. But that's the negative side of it. The positive side is that they're very good at interfacing with people. And um, they, people trust them, and they, if, they use, if they use that for good, as it were, that they know how to gain someone's trust in order to help them, um, you know, uh, to calm people down and sort of have this psychological relationship going on. And that works very nicely with kind of this traditional notion of, of the clergy being the, the bearers of love for good or ill, depending on how they use that. Um, and then also like the, the front and the facade and things need to look, you know, reputation is very important because you lose your power as a clergyman if you lose your reputation. That's the, that's the ideal anyway. You certainly lose respect in the eyes of the people, the congregation. Um, so that's, that's kind of what's going on there. Um, plutocrats. So here's where we get into the controversial territory. Uh, 17 minutes into the video. Um, so plutocrats, which in Mozart Beams I call the Democrats, the reason I wanted to experiment with plutocrats is one, because of the connection with Earth and the coins that fell out naturally from the way I arranged this. Um, but So the notion here is supposed to be that the plutocrats, so when I called them Democrats, the idea was supposed to be they, it's the opposite of the aristocrats and the contextual. They don't want their perspective, they want everybody's perspective pooled into sort of a single joint perspective that is the most objective, the most universal. That's why I use the term universal. Um, the unfortunate part of that is that you, you then have the problem of INTPs and even ENTPs being, um, what would be the right word? Misanthropic is maybe too strong a word, but you know, there's many INTPs who are like, I don't really relate to that because you know they are genuinely very idiosyncratic and are perfectly happy to say people are idiots. <laughs> you know, you get that problem. And it's like, okay. Um, now I normally solve that problem by saying, well, it's not that they're they're interested in getting you know, it's not that they're really interested in the individual people one by one. They're interested in the the universal aspect of trying to get outside of any one particular person's temperament and uh, get, get this outside perspective on the universe. Um, I'm trying to get at the same thing with plutocrat, which I think works better in the sense of um, it is synthetic in that they're trying to reduce everything down to one currency. They're trying to reduce everything down to a principle which is what the clergy are doing. The clergy are trying to unite everybody to one principle, bring everybody into the arms of the church, right? Symbolically speaking. Plutocrats are trying to unite everybody as well in a way, but they're also analyzing them because you're breaking them down not into, you're, you're not absorbing them into one uh, church. You are breaking them down to their cash value. <laughs> 
<laughs> you, are, you are breaking them down to some currency, some common currency that can stand in for anything so that everything becomes kind of relative. This is something that I do think that my, my it's, because the thing about universalism is it also necessarily has this relativism to it. I mean, the way that I'm describing it here and certainly how it shows up here. Um, in like, you know, take Kant, for example. You have the categorical imperative. And from one perspective, it's like, oh, it's absolutist, it's universalist, and it is. But precisely because it is absolute and applies everywhere, it also becomes highly relativistic, um, which Kant kind of backtracked against. But the principle is still there, where it's like, well, you, as long as your maxim can pass the test of the categorical imperative, it's on the same standing as any other maxim, right? So there becomes this relativity uh, which is the same here with the notion of reducing everything down to, to, this, to this money. It doesn't matter if it's a gun or if it's a teddy bear or if, if it's medical aid or whatever. All of it can be reduced down to a price um, that can be analyzed logically, but it's all the same thing. It's all synthetic. Um, so... And that's where you get kind of the universalism from it. So that's what I'm trying to get at there. Now, the problem is that the ESFJ, um, which worked very nicely with the old style of democratic, um, symbolically, you're not going to think plutocrat when you think of ESFJ, but you have to remember the notion of um, uh, 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 the unity that comes from reducing everything down. And you do still get that with the ESFJ where you get this sense, this is what the INTJs don't like about ESFJs, is the ESFJ will try to reduce um, the INTJs' individuality down, right? Try to pull them down from the nobility and say, yes, but I can buy everything that you have and reduce it down to this common currency that unites all people. Isn't this wonderful, right? I'm going to try to bring you in, reduce you into the common currency of everybody, and then we can all cooperate, and it can be this collective. And, um, and, uh, and Nietzsche is like, flee, flee, <laughs> flee to the mountains. Um, anyway, so that's the plutocrats connected with the notion of the merchants. Finally, we have what I originally called the anarchists, what I will in future videos probably still refer to as the anarchists. Um, but just in this video, I wanted to play with calling them instead the Democrats. So I've shifted Democrat over here. So the reason for that is this. I actually think that the notion behind democracy works better here because it is purely analytic. Here, it's a mixture of analytic and synthetic, and that's how you get the notion of coin. But here, it's pure analytic, because you're not assuming that everything's going to reduce down to one currency. In fact, you are assuming that is not the case. You are analyzing each individual thing as its own thing, with its own incommensurate value with anything else, which works much better with democracy with the notion of each person has to be consulted. You cannot reduce any single person's perspective down to just uh, uh, an underlying principle. It's not possible. Everybody is unique. If you can do that, they're not human. And you need to help them to become more human is what you need to do. Um, but uh, that's sort of the horror, particularly for the NFPs, this notion of everybody being reduced down to one principle or one uniting thing that, that takes away their individuality, which is kind of what you know, the, the archetypal church is trying to do, reduce everybody and bring them into the arms of this one, um, this one blob of light. I, that's just what keeps popping into my head. But here it's like, no, we want each seed, that's why it fits nicely with those, we want each seed to grow on its own, up in its own place, and produce its own fruit and flowers. And every fruit and flower is just as beautiful in its own way as every other fruit and flower. Um, that's the principle behind it anyway. Um, I feel like I might be pushing a little bit too much on that because you do have the SGJ, S, S, STJs in there. And I, 
I know it's not in principle correct that the, that the Democrats are just like, oh, everything goes, because they can be very like, no, this is wrong, this thing is wrong. Um, so it might be that there is still some, I don't want to say a hierarchy, but there is still judgment to be made. But there's, there's this important element of, of, um, that I'm trying to get at with the notion of Democrats, where every person's opinion matters in and of itself on its own, and that, you know, what you want to get at is the individual and see what they actually care about. Um, so I don't know. Th those are my ideas for the Democrats. I think it is a bit skewed still in favor of the NFP types. Um, and the, uh, but I think that the notion of, the notion of like a collective of the commons, um, that's why I use the term commons because it has more nobility to it than peasantry because peasantry assumes someone is over top of them. Um, with commons, I'm trying to get at the notion that no, this is like a community. They're not necessarily under the thumb of a nobility. They're just like, a farming collective that are together and they pool everybody's ideas and then they try to move forward with some sort of a plan. Um, so, yeah, so the, the association with staffs and then the association with fire. Um, so with, let me go back here, the plutocrats associated with earth because that's where the ore comes from, right? Also, that's where we all come from. We're trying, you know, everybody turns back into dust, that sort of morbid side of things, but that's where the ore for coins comes from. Uh, Pluto, right, he was the lord of the, of the underworld and the earth and also of all the riches that are therein. So that's where the earth is coming from. Um, I didn't mention it before for the theocrats, water, uh, very adaptable. It adapts to whatever container it is placed in. So that's, that's why water works very nicely here. I already touched on air, the rarefication notion. Um, fire, uh, fire rises, and it's also kind of like the energy that makes the plants grow. It's in kind of an interesting paradoxical image. But there's also this notion that I can't get out of my head of like revolution, like the workers unite. I don't know, maybe I could call it, well, we'll stick with commons, but um, there, there's the notion of the, of the fire rising up from the earth. And um, I, I feel like rather than fire, you could maybe say energy. There's like all of this individual energy involved with the Democrats, um, and the energy causes things to grow in their own way um, up from the earth. So yeah, so I think that covers all of the main basics I wanted to. I put the primus animus in there as a reference to the previous video. Um, that's sort of like the uniting whole at the beginning or at the center of this mandala I have created. And uh, yeah, that, that covers everything. So I uh, hope you found this interesting. Uh, let me know in the comments section below, and I will see you in the next video, whenever that is.